Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Shelby. And this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Tonight, we're still socially distanced. Ross is in the Northeast, regaling us with tales of the Merritt Parkway and how close it is to his house. <laughs> Shelby's out in California, and I'm still in the Midwest. Uh, regaling them with tales of going under the really short train bridge to actually get back into my house to record a show tonight. Yep, yep. And this is welcome back. This is welcome back to Shelby. We uh... well, it's the welcome back to Shelby for you and me, but for the audience, yes. they didn't really get to. It's an introduction again because I only posted a couple clips from the show that I could salvage. I was going to so. say we we were together on the internet for a little bit. Yes. We that for has occurred, which is like the weird part of like doing a show like this. And I'm like, oh, I'm running late. There's stuff going on. But like, OK, at least it's somebody I've already spent an hour talking to. And so yeah. like they're at least familiar with me. So yeah. they know I'm not just being a total jerk right now. So yeah. We know they're willing to come back so that they don't hate us. <laughs> so thank yeah. you, Shelby, for coming. Which back. is no one will ever understand what it means to produce this show with because everybody travels and is like all of the guests are people who go for long periods of time into the woods or desert or mountains by themselves mm -hmm. with no signal and so you're like you're like well that person doesn't like me anymore they haven't responded in three weeks six <laughs> weeks later here's the yeah. response back now and that was not shelby's timeline that was not yeah and that, was, <laughs> that, was, that was like people that was are a also different person doing starlink and all that stuff now <laughs> but yeah no it's it's yeah. Some people choose to disconnect for us. They didn't want to. Some people choose to not respond. <laughs> thank That's you, Shelby, for you. responding. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Chris, for producing and, and connecting and all of that. It is yeah, it's it is you that, it, so. that makes this happen. So just <laughs> gotta put that out there. So speaking of producing things, Subaru has produced an impresa in your driveway. Yes, they have. They have. Well, I don't think that's the vernacular that we want to use for. It came out things. of a factory um, and then it came it out of a, appeared in your driveway. Place. So I'm going with produced. And, and, and it is a production it item. Here, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have the Impreza hatch, the five door. Um, it leaves tomorrow. It's uh, it's very white and it has RS plastered all over it. The seats, the gauges, the you know back. Um, it's a very good car. It is surprisingly spacious and comfortable and uh, inherently Subaru y. Uh, it is. Subaru y. <laughs> I, I, it, what is Subaru y? Uh, safe. It just feels like it is always going to take care of you. Even is it ready if. Ready for a puppy? Dude, no. Uh, that's it. I was I was looking through pictures on my phone earlier today, trying to find something for an article, and I found a picture of Camille in the puppy pit at the Subaru booth at the North American Auto Show in uh, in the city. And I will have to bring that back up when it is time to have Camille back on. Um, okay. But no, the, but the the Impreza is just, it always feels like it's going to take care of you. It's just comfortable. It feels safe. You can see everything. Um, the infotainment is tragic. And it. But that's been their standard for a bit. Yeah. Now. Like. Right. The people that buy an Impreza aren't, like, it has a CVT, it's all wheel drive. They don't give two shits about the infotainment like it works it does bluetooth does carplay it does all that stuff like fine um i don't like that it says rs everywhere and it is zero percent sporty but i have the same complaint about that trailblazer thing that i have last week so that also said rs which stood for rally also sport. also said rs at least that would do allegedly enormous burnouts in front wheel drive with traction control off and then would lock it into all wheel drive and hold revs in. yeah so okay um yeah no so the impreza the impreza is good um I, I i had an okay time with it i i had the cross track a month yeah, ago that. month two months ago I really like the Crosstrek compared to the Impreza. So for 
So how much was the, the So the I have difference? to tell you, the year, the first year that I competed, this is totally off subject, but the first year I competed for Ford at the Rebel Rally was in a Bronco Sport. And I had no idea how a Bronco Sport was going to behave in the dunes. But there were none I could get my hands on, so I rented a cross trek because it was actually kind of like the closest vehicle. And I took that thing rides. out to the dunes. Yeah. Yeah. And and the cross trek is basically just a lifted Impreza. But the I was only say, thing that's the only difference, right? Yeah, the only thing you sacrifice is like a little bit of efficiency and maybe a tiny bit of vertical cargo space in the trunk and like the Impreza it's fine it's a car it does the things it needs to do the Crosstrek is actually genuinely really good and it's very clear that Subaru is putting their money into things that have ground clearance just from differentiating the two of those which are the same car just with investments put in different places so i mean i do ha- i do have a side by side of the uh cross track 2024s or of the priors uh, sure but like sure. Bo- body line wise like pretty pretty close yeah but then like fog light fascia um, definitely lifted higher I think they've gotten even more similar. So that's the, is that the, I think that might be the prior cross track and the outgoing and present, but yeah. Anyways, that's enough time allocated to those. Uh, the well, Impreza I will leaves... say I was impressed. I was impressed that it actually went anywhere in Dune. Yeah. Was it? Like the thing have... is not made to go in, the, in that sort of off-roading. Did you try X mode? Uh, really hard to say. Yeah, probably. <laughs> the best probably way to do. Know. I don't think X mode would work good in the dunes because X mode is supposed to be for like snow and mud, but like dunes is you want to have higher RPMs of tires, right? Like you do want dunes, higher yeah, RPMs. You just want yeah. Sport mode I, traction stability. I off. probably was in sport mode. Yeah, yeah probably. I don't know. But I it, think X it was mode great. kicks off. I think it kicks off at like 25 miles an hour, Ross. Really? Yeah, that's I why X on mode the... was like crawling. Right. So as you're going high speed, it kicks off like it won't go. So the, oh, yeah, the yeah, RPMs yeah. or the wheels, the revs that she wants for the dunes, mm. X mode would have been deactivated. So that's why on the wilderness versions, X mode is engaged now to like 35, 40 miles an hour. Oh, it kicks okay. Off. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Thank, thank you, Subaru rep, who, uh, yeah. Mr. Dominic, uh, for riding with me and telling me that piece of information Dom Fonte. two years ago. Hi, yeah. Dom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dom's, a good, Dom's a good dude. I saw him. Dom's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, we had a good time at the auto show a few years ago. It is it is um, random, the information your brain retains from, like, that's literally, right? like, 2021, I think, <laughs> in the fall. Like, But <laughs> there is still no wilderness version of the brz so and there won't be you still my weeping <laughs> part um yeah you're so, always gonna find some reason to complain about all of the cars that subaru's selling constantly i learned to drive manual on my uncle's uh 05 legacy gt wagon and i have forever been a subaru fan since and thusly living in the Northeast where Subarus are as prevalent as prevalent gets for Subarus other than maybe like Seattle or Tacoma. They're, or they're pretty popular in Denver like too, big guy. Denver. They're yeah. pretty popular <laughs> in the Pacific <laughs> Northwest. Yeah. I want the best for Subaru and I want the best for the Subaru enthusiasts. And I think there is a parallel where they can make a cross trek with a stick and a turbo and a BRZ with a turbo and I mean, lift, of course <laughs> but also the solterra the evs at the same time there's this parallel where you know they meet their carbon emissions and they meet their epa goals and credits and everything and they can coexist to get there but i don't work for subaru 
So well, and we don't we don't need to talk about this anymore. I, I will re reshare what Mr. Infante told me when I asked him that exact question about Bane Please and turbos. Please, they do. sell every one that they can make. They're literally at capacity. They don't have no yeah. reason to go add other things that could potentially fail on a car. Like right. they're already selling them all. They're possibly the brand that is in most to most in tune with what their buyers want. A hundred percent. That's like we always have to remember automakers are a business. So they exist to sell and have profits. So good now, for them. Now I have the, the clip from uh, the Netflix show Snafu in my head. Uh, you haven't seen it? I'll send it off air. Like I, I don't want to offend people. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely send it up. I'll send it ah, to you both later. So, I will. Just look up Google. Snafu and Subaru later, Ross. Not right, right now. Focus, okay. Ross. Focus. Um, yeah, focus it. <laughs> Uh, speaking of and focusing, it's not a Ford Focus. Not a Ford it's, Focus. It's definitely, well, there is no Ford Focus here anymore. So, um, that said, I did start watching Long Way Up, and there is a Ford Focus RS, one of the like carbon gray ones at Ewan McGregor's house. And he also does drive a either TRD off road or TRD Pro Forerunner, uh, in his. First episode of Long Way Up, but I'm only in the first episode, even though it's two years old. You're now old now. I was to say, speaking of old television again. Um, so the Impreza leaves tomorrow, which when this airs will be last week, and it is replaced by the, and I'm reading this off the opposite screen, 2024 GMC 2500 four-wheel drive crew. Yeah, crew cab. This is my daughter does. Yeah, crew cab. Eighty four X AEV edition. So the base price goes from eighty one eight plus the Duramax plus the AEV plus a few other things, and it's one hundred and four thousand dollars. Holy fuck! That's a lot of money. Yes. And I'm going to put a nineteen thousand dollar quad in the back of it on Saturday, which when this comes out will be in the past, but it will be uh yeah, it, it it's we can buy a, some land for that price of vehicle. Like how many acres could dude, you get for the price of a truck? Now? Ten years ago, <laughs> you could get the truck, the quad including all of the stuff that makes them what they are plus a plot of land to to drive them on and use them on yeah um, that is yeah an expensive I, I, truck <laughs> yeah there are only a few vehicles that have crested i know we've talked about the escalade being at like 109 ish with the yeah. diesel as well but like that was a cadillac at least you're yeah, just talking I'm, about a gmc truck uh, the only other vehicles that i've had that are more expensive than this are fun facts R here raptor r alpina xb7 right um f-type convertible r75 which is basically the last of them um wasn't raptor r like 111 ish yeah, Raptor R was one twelve. Alpina B eight was one fifty two. So uh, X BMW XM was one sixty one sixty eight. <laughs> and that's the one that you and Johnny both agree doesn't look the way it drives. That's the one that Jeff told me that I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> and then Johnny said all the things that you wanted to say. <laughs> So yeah, I'm I'm gonna leave it there. That's so you got an expensive truck coming. I <laughs> the other day, uh, obviously I went to Denver to pick up the roof rack parts, and then the sidebars. Uh, Peter was super nice and sent them to me. I still haven't put it together yet, mm. but it is in my garage now, laid out. So the baseline, good. baseline good, good. overland roof rack. I have enough room. I'm gonna put it together in the heated garage. But I was looking at the PDF version of the instructions the other day and step one is like, remove your stock rack. And I was like, I'm going to hold off on that. It's shit is cold and it's hard to get the Suburban in the garage right now just by itself. So don't you have a three car garage? 
yeah, I also have four kids and so stuff happens. So, but I am getting rid of some stuff. I also have two boxes full of like LX wheels. Like the stock huh. LX470 wheels are in the garage. Like I got, there's you know, some stuff I need to like rearrange. You probably sell that at a, like on the I hit mud. Yeah, yeah. no, no. Like I, I know I could get rid of them. Like Just it's not. Just get rid of them. Just have your kids get rid of them. Post better them yet, I could, I could put them on the Sequoia because it's the same bolt pattern as the Sequoia. <laughs> and it Which would go I down. Which I have the, the yeah, I have the TRD wheels on the Sequoia. Um, and so white Sequoia with the black TRD <laughs> wheels. I literally had uh, an experience the other day. I was running this like <coughs> Whole Foods or something to return something for Amazon. And I I had left my wife at home to go run the errand, right? And as I'm going in, I was like, why is my wife here now? Somebody else is also running a second gen Sequoia with the black TRD wheels on it in well, my neighborhood now. And so it kind of like, I did I had to do like a triple take on who's driving that truck because I still have the stock <clears throat> roof rack on the Sequoia. So I swear to God, I, like I just left my wife at home and I thought she had driven to the same place as me. And I was like, do we need to have a conversation? No, that's not the same. So it's totally not the same. Lady. Second gen Tundra prices are flatlining because people are realizing they don't want the New ones? Third gens. The third gen hasn't worked itself out in the way that it needs to. Um, Wait, hold on. How many gens of Tundra do we have? The third gen is out now. They don't... Oh, that seems so weird to me. Yeah. Because... No. That's really not a fourth gen. It's only the third gen? It's only the third gen. Same with Sequoia. Sequoia, Tundra, same thing. They're the, what, they're the same truck. Differs with you. They're the same truck, and un, until uh, recent. <laughs> so, so my favorite part is like, you're accurate, oh. but Wikipedia calls the second gen only until 2013, and then 14 to like 21 is listed here, but just listed under second gen, but not in the same. Which is why in my brain I'm like, that's not all. I mean, yes, it's the same structure underneath, but. That's when they usually call things like 2.5. Yeah. like it's Which I do think on the Tundra channel. forum, they differentiate like 2015, 20, that era, 14, like 2.5. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's not the exact same like truck on the inside is why I was like, that, that's mm. not. Anyway. So I'm going to put a roof rack together soon. Once I get Good. to free time. Good. High school sports are destroying me right now and i only have one kid in high school sport so uh i get to go to a small town tomorrow night um and then friday and saturday to a different area high school so how small i don't know i literally don't know the population everybody has a, such a different definition of small town it's so interesting um, like shelby's like small town is like you know a couple hundred thousand people <laughs> And Chris is like, small town is six. <laughs> five? I mean, I'm originally from Reno, people. Nevada. Okay, that is a small town. Yeah, 5,000 uh, people. I would agree with that. But like, Ross, like the metro area I'm from is like two, it's like two and a half million total. But like, nobody, they never count the whole metro. They count like the individual cities because we were split by state lines. The metro area, yeah. Yeah, so like the entire interstate that circle the whole of the metro area includes like 2.5 million yeah. people here. But like Casey Mo proper is only like 400,000 people and Kansas City, Kansas is like 300,000 people. And then like all the little suburbs around it kind of thing get, get added. But yeah, I'm going to a town of 5,000 people tomorrow night. 5,000, okay. So yeah. uh, Reno is 270 and the town that I, town city that I live in is about 130. 135 yeah. so so for context the the high school where my kid goes to high school has about 2,000 kids in the high school and we're gonna go wrestle in a town that has 5,000 people total so yes. <laughs> contextually yeah, like, um, everything in context yeah my my town growing up was 20 and my high school 
high school didn't break a thousand people until my brother's year, which was four years later. So, which when I tell my wife that stuff, she's like, I grew up in New York City. This is, I was uh, say, she, I was like, where did yeah, Sam grow up? I don't know the top of my head. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, 20,000 people is basically what, what was in the, you know, the, the corridors within a half mile of her. So, you want to really blow your mind? I taught at a middle school, so only sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in Florida, and there were twenty four hundred kids in that building. Wow. Yeah, that was just yeah. different. Anyway, anyway, speaking of different, <laughs> let's go to a different topic. Well, that is a tangent of tangents. <laughs> Sam just texted me. I hear Stat Island. <laughs> I'm going to say, you know how many, f- this is my Fun life. Ross is, I way. forgot to, to, uh, let, to check if we went live to YouTube. <laughs> uh, okay, good. No, I don't think so. Woo. That's up away. Anyways. So the software we use for this sometimes goes live and sometimes doesn't. It's just random. Yeah. I'm like, I'm so glad I pay. For it's his not, service that maybe works and maybe doesn't. Yeah, so, it's not. Yeah, it's not random. It's, it's just a. Uh, I would say it's like owning a British, an older British vehicle. Like maybe, maybe not. We'll yeah, find out. It's um, what's the name of that company? Something Electrics. Lucas. Uh, Lucas, Lucas Electrics. Electrics yeah. Otherwise known as the Dark Prince, because when the electrics fail, the lights go out, so they call him the Dark Prince. Like it, right? <laughs> it's proper, proper British. Oh, that's actually. Very, yeah, I don't okay. see us being live right now. No, I, I double checked. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what are you focus, Ross? Focus. <laughs> Sorry, no, no. I have computer, computer, work computer. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, we can like it's literally over my shoulder. The extra monitor. Uh, she said it, three thousand in the school, and divide that by four grades. We don't have to figure out her class. It's okay. <laughs> no one asked. <laughs> uh, plus, hey, it happened after the year 2000, so it doesn't matter anymore. I say that because I graduated in 1999. So, <laughs> <clears throat> showing that age off tonight. All right. Shelby, yep. where would you like to begin? Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, geez, I don't care. Do you want to go? Let, let's <sighs> go. Um, I mean, I did look at your show notes briefly. Let's I just uh, call it start all at the with, moment. Yeah. How did <laughs> you gonna... get involved in off roading? There we go. And I'm like, pretending to ask this too. for the first time, even though I. This is a, a, a redo. It's one of those shows where we've luckily <laughs> that there's been enough time in between now. I've kind of forgotten <laughs> some of it. No offense. <laughs> It's fine. I remember last time I just talked on and on and on and on and on and on about I don't even know. I think my grandpa. I don't even think I was talking about what, what he was I part did, of it. So. Well, let's talk about more about you this time then. So, so how Start did there. you get it? How did you get into off roading? What's your background? What's your what's your involvement from uh, from life here? Well, I mean, so it all starts with that grandpa. That's how the tangents get started. Um, and so my, my grandpa was Ron Hall or is, and, um, you know, he was a pretty, um, he was a, a really a pioneer of off-road motorsports. And, um, <clears throat> by the time that I came to life and, um, was born, he was pretty heavily, um, involved in off-road in both racing and in, teaching and training and um he was a brand ambassador so really i mean i just i grew up off-roading my dad was always a part of the business and my mom was a part of that business so anytime that they were out in the desert whether it was teaching off-road driving classes or it was racing my mom had to take me and my sister with her and like really some of my earliest memories are of me creating forts um in sagebrush. <laughs> wow. 
And, you know, so I was just like, I don't know, probably eating rocks and, you know, talking to myself or whatever while they were teaching classes. And then at the end of the day, um, I would beg, I would beg my dad to take me for a ride in the racetrack. And so he would strap me in and I was tiny. I mean, I was before school age, so four maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and I do remember this. He would strap me in, and of course, you know, I barely fit in the seat. I couldn't see over the dashboard, and I can, I can still barely see over the dashboard. And he would be cruising around, and I would just beg for him to go faster and faster. It was never fast enough. And so, you know, it just evolved as I got older, the more I hung around. There was a period of time in my teenage years where I, I didn't. You know, it was probably, I was too cool to hang out with my family. <laughs> so your teenagers, you are up, like, chemically obligated to do everything that your family isn't doing. Correct. Yes. It's chemically obligated. Yeah. So, well, um. <laughs> that's built, it's built into our brains, literally. Chris is, <laughs> have to. Chris is like, yeah. get out of my house. <laughs> no, 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 that's not just me, but like, that's all, like, it's an evolutionary trend. It like, that's what helps oh, yeah. diversify the gene pool. Yeah. So you don't like, for lack well, of a better term, marry your sister. You go out and you seek others to divert. Like that's the it, lizard brain. Like we don't talk about that enough, but yeah, that's why teenagers don't listen to their parents. That is the, okay. Nope. Continue. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, evolutionary so, biology. I took, I took a, you know, a, a small hiatus from the off-road world, um, but I came back, and um, my grandpa had pretty well, like, retired from um, from professionally racing, mm-hmm. and which was lucky for me because he was able to really devote time to spend with me. You know, when yeah. when I was younger, and when that was his priority was racing you know that was his job like he was mr competitive yeah um and and i kind of got this like softer side of him where he was looking to pass on that legacy and to to teach me what he knew i mean i still didn't get it at the time but (laughs) um it took me like years later to figure out that he was teaching me by you know through experience uh, so we started racing together in 2012 and it was, it was so much fun. You know, it was awesome to be able to be in Baja with him. He has so many great stories. He is the only person that raced the first 50 Baja 1000. So he spent a lot of years and a lot of miles down in Baja, um, so it was really, it, it was a great experience learning from him. And um, and then in 2019, I became a hired driver. I drove for the first uh, a side-by-side team. And later in that year, I was introduced to Ford. They were finally, finally going to be launching the new Bronco. I mean, you guys probably know better than I do. How long was the actual uh, launch of it? Like seven years or something? Yep. Not the Very launch, but I mean the lead up to it. Well, they showed I, a Bronco at, at at the auto show in New York in like 2003 or four, which means in in Ford terms, like. The Ford GT was an underground project for years before it came out in 2000. What was the first year? For the GT? It was the second GT the first... that came out like that. We had no idea they were redoing the yeah, GT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to say it was like 18 months underground. Like nobody knew it about it. And it was like, poof, new car, here we go. But Bronco time. launch took forever. The, the first Bronco year of the podcast, a it was a running joke that we would just talk about bronco news like whatever new bronco news had leaked out i swear to god we did it for like 10 months before they finally released the actual trucks yeah and then (laughs) we had a show where it was like we had will bird who hooniverse contributor friend of the show was like 
I touched the Bronco. Yeah. Because like, he was there for an event where they could actually, you know, put hands on a... But nobody had driven it yet. Like it was still yeah. like it was yeah, still yeah, like yeah. sitting in this marina in DC kind of thing. Like it was weird. Yeah. So yeah, it took a long time to build up and release the Bronco. So, so it took a long time. So in twenty, um, it must have been early early twenty nineteen. Um, my grandfather got a phone call from Ford, and they wanted to take a trip out to our hometown, and they wanted to show my grandpa, what the new Bronco looked like. And, um, which was pretty cool. So we set up this really like super secret meeting and it was just my grandma and my grandpa and my dad and myself. And they had a small team. There was maybe four or five of them that came and they brought a virtual reality setup which was great. My grandfather was in a wheelchair at this time. So getting in and out of a vehicle would have been really challenging. And um, they put those VR glasses on him and they had actually set up the look of the Bronco of uh, the same livery of his 1968 Bronco. And we got to see it. You know, it wasn't real life, but it was really damn close. And it looked really, really bitchin'. And the whole experience was really special. Um, you know, obviously they wanted to kind of bring back those racing roots. And mm-hmm. so they, they wanted to bring back the story of my grandfather winning the Baja 1000 overall in his Bronco mm-hmm. in 1969 which is the only four-wheel drive vehicle that's ever won the Baja 1000 overall. Still, to this day, which blows my mind. (laughs) And and with how, like, King of the Hammers and Baja seem to have, like, a kindred spirit as of, you know, the last five years. Yeah. Yeah. It is amazing that that stands. It is amazing. So that was my that was my introduction to Ford was that meeting and I mean they had no idea that I existed they had no idea you know really probably very much about our whole family I don't know um, but it meant a lot and my my grandpa passed away not long after that um, he had a disease called progressive supranuclear palsy mm-hmm. and. So I I had happened to get one of their contact information of, of the guys who came. I sent him an email and I just wanted him to know how special that was for my grandpa that, you know, so much of his life was were, were memories now and yeah. for them to still recognize and, and thank him for what he had done for the brand so many years ago was just really, it was great. And that email really started a relationship between me and Ford. And basically they responded and said, well, wow, we had no idea that Rod Hall had a granddaughter. We had no idea that she, that you raced. This is, you know, this is incredible. Like, I don't know how we can involve you, but we would love to keep this, this conversation open. And, of course, I was like, yeah, man, I mean, I'll carry people's baggage to Baja. I don't care. This is just such a cool experience. Yeah, yeah. And, boy, it became more than carrying baggage to Baja. <laughs> um, Seriously. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So, the, you know, uh, later that year. The notion of snowball is the exact opposite of how. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this should be phrased because snowballs downhill. And this has done the opposite. It has like literally gone polar opposite trajectory for you, and it's amazing. it's been wild. It's been it's crazy to look back and think about where I was in 2019 and the trajectory that I felt that my life was on, and the amount of you know the the highs and the lows. It's been you know it hasn't been an easy couple years, but it's been um, it's been my dream, you know. It's everyone's dream in the race world to get that phone call from a manufacturer 
And, and that came later in 2019 and they asked if I would be interested in driving for the Bronco R Baja 1000 team. And of course there was no, no hesitation <laughs> and um, went back and drove with them again in 2020. And, and both of those years, the, the team was um, really comprised. Uh, Cameron Steele was the head of the team and, so in those two years, I got to work with legends, absolute legends, Johnny Campbell, Brad Lovell, Jason Scherer. Um, I mean, people that I would just see on TV and be like, oh, yeah. these guys are so awesome. Yeah. And then I was teammates with them. And, you know, I really utilized that time to ask a lot of questions and just really like listen and absorb as much information as I could. And, um, and then after the 2019 Baja 1000, I thought, well, man, I mean, how often do I have Ford in front of me? So here's my opportunity, right? Like I've got to just yeah. give them, throw down. I have to present what ideas I have. And, um, and so I did. And I, I presented the idea for Ford to go compete in the Rebel Rally. You know, the, the rally is, is really designed for production vehicles. Yep. Um, the, the woman who created it, Emily Miller, was also mentored by my grandfather. And my grandfather, his whole career until the, the day he died, he raced for manufacturers. And mm -hmm. so it was his <clears throat> job to make, um, production ve put production vehicles in their element where they would succeed and so i thought man the rebel rally is exactly where ford needs to put bronco and so we in 2020 they i mean i couldn't believe it but ford said yeah let's do it let's go to the rebel and let's field three teams and uh so we did we put together three teams and we went to the rebel and my teammate penny and i won the X cross class, mm -hmm. which was pretty incredible. It was um, the very first win for the new Bronco lineup. Even, even the guys had been out racing Bronco and, and didn't win. So what, what, uh, what defines that class? Uh, just no uh, transfer case. No transfers. Okay. So just no low range. No, this is a sport okay. Ross Bronco sport. No, I know, I, I know, but um, our our podcast is nothing nothing if not uh, rebel rally focused. So I'm I'm trying to extract those <laughs> those details. So in rebel, there's just two classes. Yeah. There's the X cross class and the four by four class, and and really the major difference is um, having not having a transfer case. Obviously, if you look at the two types of vehicles, they have a lot of differences. However, <laughs> you could, you know, <laughs> you could have, um, if a vehicle was from the manufacturer, super built, but just didn't have a transfer case, you could put it in the X Cross Club. That just wanna, isn't a thing. Do you want to talk more about the Rebel Rally intricacies, difficulties? What did you experience that you didn't expect? Even though you have significant off-road racing history, <laughs> what like what's what shocked you in the rebellion? Everything. <laughs> so everything, and it still continues to every year. This is my this year was my sixth year competing. Well, let's do 2016, 21, 22, 23. Oh, sorry, my. 16, 20, 21, 22. Chris, this was my fifth year competing. So, Chris, just to clarify, I, are, are we in double digits of Rebel Rally competitors on the show? We gotta be. I mean, if if you count like people coming back, yeah, like Emmy and Lynn, well, Rebecca, that's... Sedona, Beth, um, Shelby. Um, we're, we're encroaching on double digits for Bell Rally. Yeah, absolutely. Competitors. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to apologize to somebody who I have not remembered off my brain. Oof, so. shit. <laughs> I, all right. I will await those social media direct messages. 
Sorry, ladies. Hi, I'm Colin. <laughs> so the first year that I competed was 2016, and that was the very first year of the rally itself. So yeah. everybody was figuring a lot of things out. Yeah. And that first year, I mean, I had no included. idea what I was getting myself into. What? Yourself included figuring things out, having no idea what was going to happen. Well, I mean, like the rally was figuring stuff out. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it was yeah, the yeah. first year of it, and it was, I had no idea. I didn't know anything about um, the Gazelle rally. Like, I did not know what navigation was. I thought this was, I don't know. I got there, and I was like, this is really crazy because we're not trying, we're going too fast. Everything I'm doing is too fast. We need to be slowing down so that we can be like reading the terrain and like looking for tiny roads that barely exist. And mm -hmm. um, so 2016 was like a, I didn't love it. <laughs> I'll tell you that after 2016, I, I was like, I don't, I don't really think this is for me. Like I like to go fast and whatever. It's also a slight contrast to all of the other yes. things you tend to have your hand in. <laughs> The slow, the slow yes. like, yeah. But come 2020, the rally had changed a bit by 2020. It had it had evolved, and um, and I had a lot of learning to do to catch up. Um, my navigator was awesome, and she did a really good job of getting me up to speed. And um, and we had a great time. It was it was really fun. And then in 21, we moved up to the 4x4 class. And since then, I've been competing in the 4x4 class. But, man, it is a really hard competition. It is um, – they throw a lot of curveballs at you. So, I mean, like, we train and we train and we train and we train some more. And then we get there and we're like – Hey, well, we didn't see that coming. We didn't train for that <laughs> because we've never had that type of challenge in in the rally before. So, I mean, they're just always coming up with um, with new ways to to stump us. <laughs> That's I mean, you gotta love it. <laughs> isn't that what you're supposed to say is the beauty of off roading and all and experiences? Exp but it's problem solving just fancy problem solving it's a lot of problem solving Thank it you. is um the the rally has definitely increased like the the technical driving side of it having a um you don't need a purpose-built vehicle but to have a definitely a vehicle that's capable is very much um on your side but so much of it is about precise navigation. And um, and later in the rally, when you get to the dunes, that's really important to have good dune driving skills. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a lot of problem solving. <laughs> so we, we did an episode God, forever ago with just Rebecca and Sedona being just two navigators and just having them explain what they that go was, through on the rally. And that was, it, it's still one of my favorite yeah, episodes was, because it was so intense and all of the things that I thought I knew because we, we talked to a number of competitors. I knew nothing. I know the number. Uh, I was actually just looking at that while you poor child talking. Um, I'm telling you, as a competitor, sometimes that's how I feel. Even right? is like, <laughs> I'm like, good lord! I thought I was ready for this, but boy, I am not. <laughs> it was well, March 9th, twenty twenty-two, so more than a year ago, uh, and that was Sedona and Rebecca. And okay, I have compiled a list of Rebel Rally participants that have been guests. I'll, I'll put Just, it in the description of the show, Ross. We can definitely talk about it later. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm very focused. <laughs> very. I heard something I needed to research and I went <laughs> Got it done. Yeah. So in, in the dunes, because they are 
like how do you plot a course across the dunes? Well, plotting the course across the dunes is one thing, but to actually be able to drive the course that you've created is a different, is another thing. Okay. Um, so, in um, <laughs> when we're out in the desert, we can we take a lot of headings. We can triangulate pretty well because we have mountains. We have a lot of objects that we can take headings off of to figure out exactly where we are. When we're in the dunes, we don't have that because it's just like an endless sea just of- Just more sand, right? It's just, just more <laughs> sand. So the trick is, is really staying on a direct heading. So you look out, you, you take your compass heading and you look as far out in the distance as you can and you really fixate on what you see and then you have to do your best to drive completely straight towards it. So you stop a lot because you can use your back heading. You can look at where your tracks have gone. And that's how you um, can decide if you started to go off kilter or not. <laughs> okay, real fast. And, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. have you clarify that in a second. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm... So your tire tracks, you can go back and use your tire tracks. Like you basically flip the compass the other way, take the reverse heading off your tire tracks to know yeah. if you stay true to what the heading that you were headed headed towards. Exactly. I said head yeah. a lot in like five second span there. Sorry. <laughs> so you have to stop quite frequently to be able to do that. But otherwise, you don't have any way to know where you went. So you know, in dunes, we're going up and down because you want to try and stay as straight as you can. You don't want to try and um, avoid anything. You want to drive right over it. So say you've, um, you've crossed two ranges of dunes and you're on that third dune. You can typically look behind you and see the 11s that you've created on the mm -hmm. dunes behind you. So you take your back bearing. And that will tell you if you have started to drift in one direction or another, or if you stayed directly on your heading. And it's all daytime, all day hours. It's all daytime. So Thank God. Well, for now. Triangulate. <laughs> yeah. Just wait. The uh, just the give 15th... Emily. That'll be the next conundrum. Yeah. Hi, Emily. The fifteenth <laughs> anniversary. I, I I'm not suggesting. You know, twenty-four hour runs, uh, but I'm not not. The good thing I have really good Casey life. <laughs> yeah, it's just, let's go. Casey does make one. good lights. Uh, uh, good thing I'm also not participating because how, I so like be the first person it, to lose. <laughs> and your dude. Um, <laughs> thought that was the first disqualifier. <laughs> uh, yeah. That would, yeah. So that might be a. Yeah, in in this photo, Shelby, there it appears to be tire tracks everywhere. Though, is yes. it easy to tell which ones are yours? So this picture is different because this is an actual like dune space. So okay. this is probably us like climbing Oldsmobile, which okay. has almost one million tire tracks. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's a pretty specific number. I would, um, uh, Chris, if yeah. you can go back to that picture, though, I would like to point out the fact that the uh, the whip flag is being whipped, which means there yeah. is speed <laughs> behind this picture. So, which, uh, uh, climbing a dune, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got places to go. We got a turbo <laughs> in this thing. This isn't your cross track, man. <laughs> no turbos. No turbos. Oh, sad cross track. No turbos. Um, that was a callback. Good job, Shelby. That was great. Yeah. Well played. Um, like she's been on the show before. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, sad Riverside. <laughs> um, is there any difficulty in, in balancing the difference between slow when you need to manage looking for points and fast when it's get somewhere or get over a dune or 
you know, traverse a section as quickly as possible so you can, you know, pin something down? So all of that is really dependent on how well you can communicate with your navigator. Um, and what, like, the navigator really, like you were talking about earlier, makes a route plan. So she knows um, how far the distance she should know how far the distance is until we have to make the next move. So whether we're in the desert and we're following a, an actual road or we're in the dunes, I know that we have to stay on this road for mm -hmm. 0.75 kilometers. So I'm going to go as fast as the terrain will let me to get to that 0.75 right. because everything we do is about efficiency. Yeah. And the faster I can get us to uh, close to a location that we think we need to be, the more time that allows us to be able to really hone it in. One thing that I do have to, that I've had to work on is drive slow enough that the navigator can read the paper map at the same time because as me driving. You know, I that is quite challenging to read a tiny light map while you're... Yeah your uh, driver thinks that they're a race car driver. and Because you are a race car driver. So <laughs> difficult. It's so difficult. And I know this just from, you know, doing paper maps or like a navigation device in the woods. Um, it's somehow very easy for the driver and the navigator to end up on opposite sides of where markers are and that's you know in the woods where you have like roads so out, out in the desert it, it must be so hard i i just can't even begin to fathom like as as a northeast boy you know it's it's just totally foreign I haven't experienced that, thankfully. Um, you know, I <laughs> there is we the trees. so we train trees a are, lot. I can are... imagine trees. This year we actually were in forests, and that was the first year that we had been in forests. Um, yeah. However, I felt like that made it easier because we just we really had to like stay on a road that had a specific heading. But um, until the entire region is trees <laughs> that is very true yeah. that is true and there were Again. it did make it a little bit more difficult to triangulate because you can't see much you can't see much except where you are yeah but how does that differ from triangulating when there is no reference point um you just you find you find reference points and if you are able to gauge the heading that you've been on, um, you know, you can kind of draw your own map, okay. per se, so you or your own route or your own road on the map. So the map exists, and you know that you've traveled north for 0.25, then you can draw on your map 0.25 north, and then you know that you turned a little bit to the east, so, you know, you can kind of then draw the route that mm -hmm. you've been on and see your approximate location. So how much do you rely on your trip meter? A lot. A lot. <laughs> A lot. I mean, I, this was the first year that we had terror trip issues. Um, oh, no. Right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. And, you know, at first it was a little like, oh shit, what are we going to do? Um, but, you know, we had to get, we had to think through it. And so we used the car odometer and we started figuring out how much the terror trip was off. So that, you know, and the, the offness stayed pretty consistent. So we were able to use both the, the vehicle's odometer and the terror trip that wasn't so accurate and put them together to approximate where we were and then from there you have to use landmarks and triangulate to really figure out where you are and then you can make adjustments the truck was on stock 
sized tires? 37. You don't need to change those out. They're (laughs) photoed right here, buddy. Stock 37s? Jesus. They're like half my size. My truck had stock 27s. What up? (laughs) Man, Bronco Raptor was incredible. Incredible. I love my two-door. This thing was, it was perfection. It it was amazing. I I wouldn't ask for anything more. You should Raptorify your two-door. Do the huge (laughs) fenders, 37s, you know, like go, go above and beyond. Go like Fox Live Valve. You know, do something crazy. Go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the two, the two, the two, the two four door. I know the two Bronco door. Raptor the thing would be like the length of the two door. I was but, just gonna, yeah. If we put those fenders, it would be a square. It would, just it would be, be fender all the way across. It would be block <laughs> door block. There is no, yeah. Um. <laughs> so, how much did the rally change for you going to the? Bronco Raptor. I almost said Raptor. Going to the Bronco Raptor. Just say Raptor. It just it's, <laughs> don't <laughs> fucking skirt the nonsense. It's been, okay. I don't. Um, you know the the Bronco Raptor adds a lot of comfort and convenience. I don't know if. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I can pretty well get in most vehicles and kind of figure out how to drive it. And, um, you know, the dunes, like I've said before, the dunes is really the most technical aspect of it. And Mm -hmm. that's where you need to be time in a vehicle for me anyways, to figure out where its power is, um, and all that kind of stuff. But we coming from the two door to a four door, I mean, that was pretty nice to have more room. Mm. Uh, we did do an interior build, which was pretty cool. We took out the back seats and um, built a organizing an organization platform in the back. The goal was to have no tie down. Um, and so that was kind of a fun project. So that was cool. Um But either both of them, I was actually a little bit nervous going into Bronco Raptor because the two door is so nimble and so awesome to drive. I I love it in the dunes. Um, but the first day that we took Bronco Raptor out to Glamis, it was like, yeah, this thing's gonna be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be just fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And then we went out and we almost won the stage. We were just like two points out of winning the the uh, June day. So, well, just needed more turbos. No more turbos. We just needed one less mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, do we want to? We've we've got a lot of places on the show. Do we want to talk about the Shelby Hall off road experience? Are you asking me? I hope so because I'm not. I, I'm, that. Well, I'm not asking Chris. <laughs> I, I'm t- I'm teeing it up. Yeah, I'm teeing it up. That is a redundant question, mm-hmm. and the answer is yes. We want to talk about the Shelby Hall <laughs> off road experience. Yeah, yeah. So after spending, I don't know two years um, helping launch Bronco. I, when I was launching Bronco, we did a, kind of like a, a nationwide tour of giving people rides in Broncos. Mm-hmm. And we had people in the vehicle anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes. And I really used that opportunity to ask the consumer why they were buying a Bronco and who was going to be driving that Bronco and what they intended to do with the Bronco and what off-road experience they had because the Bronco has so much to offer the you're an, an off-roader. It, I'm an avid off-roader and that thing is everything I could ask for. And so I just really wanted to find out what they wanted. Mm-hmm. And I figured out that, a lot of the people who were buying Broncos were women 
And a lot of them were very new to off-roading and, you know, asked questions like, how do you know when to push that button? And so I just felt like, and that button being, um, you know, like locking a differential. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like it was a disservice to people who are buying a Bronco to not teach them how to enjoy this badass vehicle they are spending a lot of money on. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided to start my company, Shelby Hall Off-Road, and it's been, uh, you know, in the, it's been in the making now for over a year, but uh, in 2023, we did a couple um, launch events that were awesome. And 2024, we have a pretty stacked schedule, but basically what I'm offering are off-road trail ride events. They're, they're relatively top tier events. They're multi-day. Mm -hmm. And um, for right now, they're primarily in the Southern California area. And um, we're also offering workshops. And with those workshops, I want people to learn how to recreate responsibly. I want people to understand that they can take their vehicle that they take to the grocery store and they can take it off road and bring it back home and it can take them to work on Monday. And there is, you're laughing. What a world. It's true. My two door is what I go bomb and Baja with and go get our groceries with. Um, I'm, and, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I have done that with more cars than I can count. So, <laughs> not Baja, the not bombing Baja, is, but, you know, beating the shit out of something I, and then, you know. But there's a fine line. There's a fine line of feeding the shit out of something and being able to enjoy its capabilities and learning those capabilities and learning true, what tools true, and true. products you actually need. There's so much stuff out there. It's so overwhelming. Um, you know, dollars. I think it's a billion dollar industry and you see these built vehicle vehicles, whether it's a Bronco or not on social media and you think, Oh my God, I need all of that so that I can go <laughs> be a weekend warrior and people spend every last dime they have and right. for shit I mean, they don't need. And that's what and it is. And a tub chassis. And that's the only way that I and can winches go. and so yeah. many lights. And so anyway, so I just want to teach people to, you know, risk, enjoy what they have get the things that they need and um and be a weekend warrior and that's fantastic obviously i feel ways about that man <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah tell us I how there. you really feel <laughs> but there's so much more merit to the phrase weekend warrior than it actually has to it like the people that make the weekend warrior aura real is is so important. It's yeah. the world. It's the hobby. It's the enthusiasm. It's you know the life for so many people. So. Well, and yep. those experiences are what like we talk about this all the time with the kids. Is like we don't need more stuff. We need to make more experiences and have more memories. Like yeah. that's yeah. really yeah. what we need. Like. And enabling others to have more of those experiences is fantastic. Yeah. That, that's exactly and, and, and doing it, we talk about it all the time on the show, is you don't have to go buy all that stuff. Do it with what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah, the suburban I mean, does I'll, need skid plates first, but yeah, like in a lift. But like, well, you know, there's like a few things that we like, need just like for safety protection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, <laughs> shit. I, I, I was telling Shelby before, I'm returning the Polaris Scrambler XP1000S um, in a couple of days, which when this podcast is out, will be in the in the past. Um, we'll, pour, we'll pour one out for it. And it's 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 <laughs> nineteen thousand dollars, and I love it. I enjoy everything about it. It is. A phenomenal machine, an 
absolute achievement in what an ATV can do and be. But I had the exact same amount of fun on a $2,000 quad, you know? So as the producer, I'm just going to let you know I really appreciate you taking a long breath there and pause because that's what I'm going to cut it. <laughs> uh, you know what I really like to s- <laughs> say? That's your PR promo for Polaris. Like, that was, it's amazing. It's great. Long pause. <laughs> cut. Cut. <laughs> yep. I really love everything about it, but. 19 grand. That was a really long pause that time. I'm going to have to actually... I, I, that, was, like, that, that was, was mostly for drama. Show. That was mostly for drama. No, <laughs> I... We'll see how it goes. I, I, Did he just freeze? Oh, God. <laughs> that I, has happened before. My brain is just so... I, I'm writing scripts for work stuff right now. And my is it scrambled? Is my, is my brain scrambled or the script scrambled? Because that's the same thing. Um, or why not both? I, that's, that's my third most used gif of all time is the little girl going, why not both? Like, Por que no los dos? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> if anybody wants to know more about the Polaris Scrambler XP 1000S, um, just... I, I have one more question for Shelby that's in the same realm of what you were talking about, Ross, because... I would like, I would like more questions for Shelby. She... She has some side-by-side action going on, too. Ooh, that we yeah. briefly discussed last time. Yeah, so last time we talked, I probably didn't want to say very much about it because we were still making it happen. But we... Um, I have a race car! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have never had my own race car before. I have always... Uh, driven with other teams, even, I mean, you know, even my family stuff, that mm-hmm. was my family stuff. And so over the last nine months, my boyfriend Brady and I have been putting our plans together and our skills together. And we raced our first race this last weekend, Rage at the River in Laughlin. And, um, you know, it's building a race car is a long process. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. And I, which I am learning um, again, since I've never had my own race car, I've never been a part of the whole process. And so it's been really fun for me to actually get to be a part of it. Um, Brady is, it's what he does for a living. He works on trophy trucks. So, I mean, he's got a lot more experience there than me, but yeah. Man. Dude, it's nice to have somebody the, with that kind of knowledge. Drink. It is. So <laughs> it really is. What are the bones and the actualities of your quote unquote race car? Yeah, so this thing actually is super stock. It's a 2018 Textron Wildcat Double X. It's naturally aspirated. And Arctic um, Cat we, for people who aren't familiar with Textron. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. And so, I mean, we, we had to do some safety things, like we had to make a, finish the cage so the doors no longer open. Mm-hmm. We had to add uh, front and rear bumpers. Um, Brady did make some, he like beefed up some parts, but for the most part, it's all stock parts. You see, those are stock axles that did us dirty. <laughs> <laughs> they were stock axles. They stock were. axles quickly became a, uh, obliterated stock axles. Yes. But you know, yeah. that's that's what you do with uh race trucks. Oh yeah, shit that gets subjected to Well that what now the stock people gets replaced with race truck parts. Doing exactly R&D aren't expecting yeah, and, you know, it's part of, so I don't know, probably, you know, this would have really bummed me out previously, but the amount of time and effort that we put into it leading up to the race, it was like getting to the start line was a challenge in its own. Like, it's no longer you just, like, 
show up and drive the car and like the duty is just to drive the car and make sure that the car right. gets across the finish line. It's right. like shit, man. Now it's like making sure that that car is as good as you know that it can be to get to the start line. And then the next duty is driving it. So, I mean, I was so incredibly fulfilled with our weekend, even though we did finish and so proud of the work that we put into it. And, you know, this is, this is part of the new car blues is breaking stuff and figuring out where the weak links new car are. Blues. And... Uh, new that's car blues. That's the title of the first <laughs> single from my next band. New, new race car blues for us. New race, race car. car. Race car blues. Oh, shit. Um, okay. I'm going to rewatch Blues Brothers. and. But the thing that is the just... coolest about this car <laughs> is that the seat fits me. It is high really? enough and close enough that I don't have to have any sort of additional seat cushion for me to fit in the car, which has never happened in my whole entire career of being a professional <laughs> off-road driver. <laughs> so there's actually the appropriate amount of space for you here. Yes, it is modified to fit me. Huh. Is Brady similar in size, or are you only driving? So the seat goes uh, backwards and forwards. Okay. Um, and it goes back to where he can where he can reach. Otherwise, he would be very squished. Um. <laughs> I, I say that There's, being a taller person with a shorter wife, so yes. I completely understand. <laughs> I say um, that being a moderate average height with a shorter wife. Oh. <laughs> so I'm five two. Point. I, mean, I don't know how short your You're five two. Your wives are. I'm my, five mine two. is right there at five two as well. Mine's also five two, but I am five ten, and Chris is six foot. A little million. short, six four. Yeah, six four. Oh, yeah. yeah. Chris is a large boy, and I am. I do think I the art American setup average <laughs> is a little different. I do find that, like with Can Am, um, the pedals are really deep in. So I have a really hard time hmm. fitting in a Can-Am. Um, even with the seat forward, then I oh, end I up very close with that. the steering wheel. And then, so it's, it's getting everything like proportionally, bringing the, the pedals out enough so that I can fit comfortably. Both of my arms. On the can -Am, but Dude, one, of, one of my favorite things you said tonight, Shelby, was that in looking at the side-by-side -side reminded me of this is so weeks ago, we had a friend who had a barbecue and they have some property south of town. So we all went out there kind of thing, some, but they had a, the body. what? No, nothing. Just, <laughs> no. It was a pig roast. It's different. Um, you did a pig roast. Yeah. You just put it in a box, put coals all over it. You roast the pig. It's prepared ahead of time for wow, like, eating. that is like, how it's I not just definitively like, know just put a pig in a box. Like, Nope. That's how I definitively know that we live in different parts of the country. That's the point. Okay. Anyway, um, but they had a like a 2018 Honda Talon there, and so my daughter was like, "Can I get in?" And I was like, "Well, let me figure out if I can drive it, and then we'll go do it." And the whole time, you're right, the exact same thing. She was like, "I want to go faster. I want to go faster." Like, yeah. at no point was she afraid of the speed, which now has me terrified for the rest of life. But <laughs> I'm going to make sure I get her in the dirt. I get her educated appropriately, and we'll have more fun that way. Two things. Um, uh, early that 2018 would probably be a very early Honda Talon, and second of all, uh, having daughters, them going just more, more, yeah, more. exactly, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> familiar with the territory. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what year it was, Russ. I just picked a year. Yeah, that's uh, a Honda. I'm not sure. 18 or 19. Or I saw 70 18. miles across a dirt field that I did not expect to do in 70 miles an hour across. So. Okay. I did go to the Talon uh, media launch, and I'm pretty sure that would have been, I think, 2018. I think. That's right. All I know is I had a blast wasting someone else's gasoline for an afternoon. Yep. Hell yeah. I just remember <laughs> going to look at what at the time was something that Honda had updated at the New York Auto Show, and I was like, oh, wow, they put their side-by-side up. -side in the basement that's interesting um there's not less space in new york it makes sense 
I'm not gonna touch that. I just I don't even <laughs> fucking wanna. It just, ugh, just every talk time about I house daughter, prices again. Come on, let's have a good time. It's a great show. <laughs> <laughs> That's called the Off the Rails Again podcast. Or, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it Ross's is. Ross's off his rocker again podcast. Ross is going to be frustrated with Chris again. Yeah, that's that one. Ross is going to uh, go on a tirade again podcast. It's, it, it is pretty late. You're approaching pumping time. So, yeah. Uh, no, but that, that would, oh, that your daughter is doing the same. And my daughter's doing the same. Some more, more, more. So, everything's more, always more. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the show real fast because I don't want Ross to turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> I would love this. So you can rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. We weren't live tonight. Thanks a lot. Mm. YouTube. Um, you can follow Shelby at Shelby Hall Off Road and also her website is shelbyhalloffroad.com. Uh, follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Instagram. We don't talk about Twitter anymore. Uh, Ross is no, not like the one from Friends on Instagram. I'm at Overlane Dad, and we did a show. Thank you, Shelby. Thanks, Shelby. Thank you, guys. Thank you for actually... redoing our show. <laughs> <laughs>